Um, I'd like to introduce Nick Seo, our board president, for some opening remarks. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual webinar hosted by the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island. My name is Nick Seo, president of the board of directors, and I want to thank you for being here in support of this event. This year is the 20th anniversary of hosting conferences focused on improving knowledge and awareness about brain injury and the impact of brain injury on society. Like most organizations, the COVID-19 pandemic forced changes to our conference structure. Instead of one large in-person event, this year we will involve six one-hour webinars that will address a variety of relevant and uh, current topics. This new approach allows us to engage people throughout the country but because this is a new approach, we really need your feedback. It's important to complete the evaluation as this provides an opportunity for this feedback, as well as to assure that you get the necessary CPUs. Please be sure to check out our website, BIARI.org, to explore this year's conference series running now through October, as well as many other ways that BIARI accomplishes its mission of increasing awareness of brain injury and its consequences providing education to prevent brain injury and enhancing the quality of life for those affected by brain injury. Thank you. Now I want to recognize and introduce Dan Parkinson from Encompass Health, our platinum sponsor. Dan. Thank you very much, Doreen, and um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. My name again is Dan Parkinson and I work at uh, Encompass Health Rehabilitation Hospital of Braintree. We are an inpatient acute rehabilitation hospital, and we have earned the disease-specific certifications in both brain injury rehabilitation as well as stroke rehabilitation from the Joint Commission. This means that we have a programmatic approach to our delivery of care that allow, allows us to realize the strongest patient outcomes. We have several essential components to our brain injury rehabilitation program that consist of first, utilizing evidence-based and clinical uh, and consensus-driven clinical practice guidelines, which allows us to be more proactive and anticipatory during the delivery of care for uh, survivors of brain injury. We elicit a, a multidisciplinary um, team approach that's led by Dr. Douglas Katz, a neurologist. Our team consists of physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, nurses who are certified in rehabilitation, and case managers. We also implement performance improvement initiatives that are related to our clinical practice guidelines, which really helps us to drive patient outcomes and patient recovery. We analyze our patient outcomes and our patient data, both by trending our own data over time and by comparing our data to um, other rehab hospitals within the region and across the country. I really wanna take this opportunity to thank the Rhode Island Brain Injury Association for hosting this incredible virtual event this year and for giving us at Encompass Health the opportunity to introduce ourselves to all the participants of this conference. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you, Dan. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, we have a couple of housekeeping notes. All participants have been emailed an evaluation form. Your feedback is very important to us and is your ticket to your CEUs. Email your completed evaluation to richard at biari.org. I'll put that in the chat room right after this. And in return, we will email you your CEU certificate within about a week, approximately. Note, uh, participants who sign up for the entire conference series will receive their CEUs at the end of the series in October. Lastly, please type comments and questions into the chat room area. We have reserved time um, for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the speaker for today's session, Ethics and Evidence, Hard Hats and Hard Choices, Michelle Baker. Michelle Baker is a registered nurse and senior manager of network services for Paradigm Catastrophic Care Management. Michelle's professional background includes a variety of clinical leadership roles, such as director of nursing, director of rehabilitation, and senior case manager. Transitioning into the rehabilitation, rehabilitation and case management, 
Michelle has managed catastrophically injured workers for 13 years prior to becoming part of the management team at Paradigm. Michelle has a long record of service to the Commission for Case Manager Certification, having worked on many committees. Her service culminated with her election to chair-elect of the CCMC board, serving as chair of the executive committee since 2019. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Doreen. And welcome everyone to um, Ethics and Evidence, Hard Hats and Hard Choices. Next slide, please. As we get started today, um, this is me. Um, you heard my introduction. Um, I just want to go over some learning outcomes with you um, quickly. Uh, and I don't want to read these to you, but we're, we're basically going to define the role and function of case management as it relates to workers' comp, identify ethical constructs um, and, and their barriers. Um, using evidence-based planning and ethical principles, we're going to go through some transitions of care and then understand the case manager's role in workers' comp for determining uh, long-term cost projections. Next slide, please. So I, I know you've all heard um, the saying that accidents happen, but in 2014, about uh, 2.87 million TBI-related uh, encounters happened in the United States. And being struck in the head or striking your head on uh, an object was the second leading cause of brain injury, um, which resulted in about 17% of that 2.87 million in 2014. Next slide, please. So today we're going to um, use a case study to um, go through the role of the worker comp case manager and the um, ethical facilitation of the worker's care. So to do that, we want to understand the role of case management and the ethical principles. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. Okay, so a case manager wears many hats, as we all know, um, and uh, you know they, they work on behalf of the injured worker. And this list reflects some case management roles that are really important to the role. Number one being an advocate. Um, advocacy is the most important role for a case manager. And although there's dual relationships between a case manager and the carrier that um, employs them or, or contracts with them, um, advocacy for the patient is, is number one. Um, this is defined as a person who advocates, defends, or pleads for the injured worker to ensure that their needs are met. Um, and then if a case manager is, is performing the advocate role correctly, then these other uh, these other roles kind of naturally fall into place as a coordinator, a communicator, a collaborator, clinician, educator, negotiator. All of those things fall into place when advocacy is, um, is seen as a primary function. Next slide, please. So in order to um, effectively advocate um, we and provide services, we also um, need to pay attention to our case management process, which we're all very aware of. Um, and I just want to go through kind of a high level overview of the case management process to make sure that everyone that is on the call has, has an idea of what we're speaking of. If you are a case manager, you're probably all well aware that assessment is very important in the case management process, um, where we're collecting in-depth information, typically um, at the initial um, meeting with the injured worker, whether that be in, in the hospital or with their family, um, if they're critically injured. Um, and it includes medical, um, behavioral, psychosocial, and social determinants of health um, as it relates to that injured worker prior to the injury. So any pre-morbid medical history, anything you can gather that helps with um, drawing a full picture of this uh, injured worker. Planning, creating the plan, providing guidance, using, uh, coordinating and collaborating with the care providers to make sure that a plan is put in place to address all of the care needs of the injured worker when it's needed. Um, in catastrophic injury, this can be um, a really um, challenging time because it's difficult when you're meeting a family for the first time in the waiting room of an intensive care unit um, for them to focus on, on what you need them to focus on. So a lot of times this takes multiple 
um, face-to-face -face contacts or uh, telephonic contacts with the family to get them to um, understand the case management um, process, to understand your role and, and what you're doing there and, and how you can support them. Implementation, uh, once the goals are established and the plans are made, then the implementation refers to executing that plan um, and making sure that all those needs and services are, um, are in place to achieve those goals. Next slide, please. Coordination is also part of the plan. And this is, where, this is the fun part, coordinating all of the care and, and making sure you're getting all those puzzle pieces together being the communicator between providers, um, procuring and integrating those services and resources necessary to accomplish uh, the case management plan. Um, sometimes this means um, uh, being the, the mouthpiece for, for the injured worker or their family, um, making sure that they understand what's going on and, and have an opportunity to be part of those decisions. Monitoring your plan, making sure that what you've implemented is working. So you wanna make sure, is it happening like we intended this to happen and what adjustments do we need to make? Evaluation, very, very important. So looking at outcomes, what, what did we set out to do here? What is, what is the end goal? And in doing so, documenting how things are going as you monitor and as you evaluate and really looking at what could have been done better? What is working? What is not working? What do we need to rethink? Um, we always say uh, at my company where I work, the, the, we have a saying that if you do it right the first time, you don't have to go back and do it again. And that really holds true um, to, in a lot of ways um, in catastrophic management. Next slide, please. Let's talk about ethics. Next slide. So, Case management is a professional, collaborative, and multifaceted practice guided by ethical principles in order to protect public interest. Because case management exists in an environment where they may look to the case manager to solve or resolve problems that occur in the health delivery or the payer system, case managers sometimes can be confronted with ethical dilemmas. And as you know, if you're working in this arena, um, sometimes it's, um, it, it, you have to stop and, and really kind of remember that injured worker is the center of the care. So what is best for the injured worker? How are we going to make this happen? Um, and case managers also have to abide by professional code of conduct. And for that, for whatever their specific discipline is, their certification, their licensure, um, no matter who is asking a case manager to uh, conduct activity, you always have to look to your licensure and make sure that you are working within your scope of practice. Next slide, please. Ethics, a universally accepted set of rules of behavior based on ideas of what is considered right and wrong that are adopted by a group of people. So there are difficult, uh, different ethical constructs, um, but we are gonna review the ones that are set forth as principles for case management. Next slide, please. So there are six main principles, as you know, I'm sure you've heard these before, um, that are the core of case management. Autonomy, veracity, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, and fidelity. So um, let's look at these a little bit more in depth individually. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but um, just wanted to take a, a minute to say a little bit about each one. Next slide, please. So autonomy is first and foremost. It's, it's the, the first ethical principle. It's defined as the agreement to respect another's right to self-determine a course of action in support of independent decision-making. So think about that independent decision-making, who's independent decision-making, the injured worker. So we always have to keep that in mind while we're working um, towards goals for uh, in, in case management. Case management, case managers can facilitate this by helping injured workers and caregivers by developing questions for um, a doctor's visit or by um, communicating concerns they may have to the carrier or to uh, a, a care provider. Uh, on their behalf. Um, being that mouthpiece and being that person that kind of pulls everything together 
when they're not able to, or um, they're distraught or having um, difficulty focusing. By including the injured workers and their uh, support systems and care decisions about um, within their jurisdictional guidelines, of course, um, a case manager is definitely promoting autonomy. Uh, it's respect for the client's right for self-determination. Next slide, please. Beneficence, to do good. We've all heard of this, promote good. Um, it's defined as compassion, taking positive action to help others. The de desire to do good. It's the core principle of, of client advocacy. In the role of case manager, um, we utilize compassionate advocacy, not only to promote good, but also to further the injured worker's legitimate interests as they progress along the continuum. So being there every step of the way, as long as you're allowed to. Sometimes that means standing up for perce what's perceived to be detrimental to an injured worker or something that has occurred that is detrimental and, and, and righting that wrong. Next slide, please. Non-maleficence, to do no wrong, um, repair harm cause. So non-maleficence means, again, avoiding harm. It includes preventing harm to injured workers and to rectify anything that's been done. A common mechanism of this construct is the evaluation of outcomes in order to provide a clear measure of quality of care provided, the appropriateness of the care, and even cost of care. So you ask yourself, um, were the goals achieved? Um, what could have been done better? And were there issues along the way that resulted in a poor outcome? Was it resolved? And what have I learned from this for the next time? Next slide, please. Fidelity, the duty to honor commitments. So this, this is a big one. And this is where um, building trust with an injured worker and their support system, um, it, it, it's built upon fidelity. Um, it's the duty to honor commitments. Case managers have a duty uh, to injured workers and their profession to fulfill their professional responsibility according to applicable laws and codes of conduct. Again, jurisdictional regulations, laws, um, your licensure, um, your certifications all play in. It's formally defined as the ethical principle that directs people to keep commitments or promises. So basically, um, to, to, simpl to simplify it, I don't mean to oversimplify, but if you're a case manager and you promise to call someone Tuesday at two o'clock, you call them at Tuesday at two o'clock, even if you have no new information or the plan is not clearly known. You've held your commitment to contact that family or injured worker, and you've you've uh, held up um, your end of the bargain and honored your commitment. Next slide, please. And justice, um, maintain what is right and fair. So justice is the duty to treat everyone equally. So consider what's right and fair, before making decisions, put your own beliefs in check and don't judge other beliefs, others' beliefs. Um, so uh, we're all kind of operating with cultures and norms, laws and practices. So we must learn to see, including our own, uh, other people's um, rights and, and learn that with compassion. So justice means affording each person with the support they need which will be different depending on their lived experiences. So remember your beliefs and cultural beliefs and, and, and what you live by may be different than your injured worker or their support system. So you have to set yours aside and not judge their own. Next slide, please. Okay, now that we've established a, time, a, 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 a framework here, um, and I'm sorry if I went through that too quickly, but just wanted to kind of give you a reference to um, how we were going to um, address our case study here. Um, next slide. So we're gonna talk about Joe. He is a, he was a 57 year old married construction worker um, who had two adult, adult children. He was working on a construction site with his coworkers uh, building a new uh, four-story office building in an industrial park. 
As he was walking from one side of the construction site to the other, a steel beam was released from a hoist, fell 10 feet and struck Joe in the head. Joe was rendered unconscious at the scene. Emergency medical um, services took him to the nearest emergency room. And it was confirmed that that uh, hospital was a level one trauma center. Let's look at ha what happened in the emergency room. Next slide, please. So Joe was triaged. Um, his Glasgow coma score uh, on assessment was a seven out of 15. And all that means is that he was able to open his eyes occasionally to pain. He had no verbal response and he withdrew his legs and ar his arms and legs to pain. Um, it was decided that he, he needed an airway in his, um, he needed a, a breathing tube in his airway to protect that. And so he was put, placed on mechanical ventilation. A neurosurgery consult was requested and a CAT scan of the head was, was ordered. Joe was then transferred to the neuro ICU for continued assessment and stabilization. Nothing happens in a vacuum. So while Joe was being assessed, the um, employer reported the ac accident to the uh, worker comp carrier. And due to the potentially catastrophic nature of the injury, the, the worker comp carrier immediately called a field case manager to go out and um, provide an assessment. Um, and to get, gather information to, to better identify the needs of Joe moving forward and what was going to happen. Again, uh, for this instance, there were no compensability concerns um, with this claim. We all know that doesn't happen that quickly, but in catastrophic injury, a lot of times the carrier will give the case manager an idea of whether there's an investigation that's gonna happen or whether there's no question that this was definitely a work-related accident and you know, there is no question of compensability. Determining compensability is not a case management function, but it is your responsibility to know if there's question of compensability. That just helps you to um, instruct how you're gonna communicate with care providers and with injured workers and, and their families. You don't wanna overpromise. You don't want to overcommit and say, I'm gonna help you for the next year. Um, when you don't know what's going to happen. So again, the important piece to that is just to know the compensability status, not for determination by the case manager and not, not for communication by the case manager, but just to have that knowledge to better instruct your communication. Um, the case manager that was assigned um, arranged for a visit at the hospital and, and doing so by following hospital policy, a contacting the um, hospital case manager, um, also asking if the family was on site um, so that a, an introduction could be made. It was determined when the case manager came on site after obtaining all the medical information that it was kind of unclear still what was gonna happen with Joe. However, based on the catastrophic nature of his injury, um, it, it, was, it was pretty safe to say he was going to be needing acute rehab. So um, again, Discharge um, starts at, a, at assessment, it starts at admission. You can never gather too much information um, when you are uh, performing your assessment on site. So any information you can gather is definitely going to help with your planning and implementation of, a, of, of your plan. At that time, the case manager met with, the, with Joe's wife um, and assured that her, her that information would be communicated to the worker comp carrier so that they knew what was going on. Um, and also to make sure that um, they understood the role of case management while, why you were there, why the, the case manager was asking questions about what Joe did prior to his injury, what was his, his uh, health status, um, it wasn't for derogatory reasons. It was just to better uh, plan for his recovery. So release of information. It's really important to know your jurisdictional and state guidelines for release of information, your employer's um, policy, the hospital policy, any provider's policy that you will be working with in terms of a release of information. Sitting down and um, kind of going through that with Joe's wife could, can be a challenge. Um, she's not focusing. 
she's had a traumatic injury to her husband, a sudden change in their life status. Um, and to sit and, and ask her to sign a piece of paper sometimes can be a, a tricky situation. So just being very honest and, and um, alerting her that the information shared with uh, the case manager will also be shared with the, the carrier, again, that dual relationship um, in order to keep them apprised of his progress needs to be very well um, established. The case manager continues to um, gather assessment information, which will help inform the plan going forward. So here's what we know. Next slide, please. Um, Joe and his wife live in a three bedroom home, a one and a half bath, the full bath on the second floor, half bath on the first floor. There's six steps to enter the house and 13 steps to enter the second floor. Um, or to, to get to the second floor, floor where the bedroom and the full bath uh, currently is located. Uh, Joe is a primary breadwinner. His wife was a stay-at-home mom. And since they had become as empty nester, they had become very active in church activities and volunteer work together. Um, during the interview, uh, they also had two children, uh, two adult children that lived nearby, but they also had families of their own. So they were not living in the same dwelling. During the initial assessment with um, Joe's wife, it was apparent that she was very stressed about financial issues. She asked about payments from workers' comp. And again, although it's not the case management's responsibility to um, communicate those, um, those types of issues or decide on those types of issues, it is the case manager's responsibility to communicate that back to the carrier, it, um, explain that Joe's wife has stress about that, and even go as far as to collect or to coordinate a communication between the uh, injured worker's wife and the worker prompt carrier. A lot of times when working with um, carriers that have had catastrophic injuries in the past, um, they will also ask for the case manager to um, help to facilitate that communication. So they can explain what to expect um, in terms of uh, temporary total disability payments and things of that nature. So again, not a primary responsibility of the case manager, but definitely has a role in coordinating that. There was also um, some, um, some other issues that the, the wife had, con had concerns about. So the case manager asked for the hospital social worker to come and do an assessment and, and work with his wife on um, some other issues. Um, so along this, as, as we're working through this, you know, the case manager has to continue to reinforce the fact that any information that they're given is going to be shared with the carrier and that it's open communication on either side to make sure that the, the uh, wife is, is comfortable and understands that and understands the reason for that. Um, so understanding that Joe's injury will most likely change how they live after, um, after his rehab, um, that there's probably gonna be need for some modifications, possibly some temporary modifications to the home, some durable medical equipment, um, and, and some other aspects that need to be accommodated for his needs. So again, discharge begins at admission. Um, knowing that there's gonna be expectations for change to the home environment and um, we don't know where Joe's going to end up yet in terms of his functional abilities, um, but just keeping that in mind as we're making our plan moving forward. The case manager's assessment demonstrates how appropriate care can be planned for Joe, and it il illustrates the, um, the role of advocacy. advocacy. Uh, workers' comp case managers advocate by, for Joe by recommending and coordinating the most effective plan of care leading to the most ideal recovery possible. So the, assess the assessment itself um, is intended to not only look at medical records, um, and, but also use contact with the family, providers, um, previous care providers, and the employer to get a full picture. Evaluating the cur current treatment plan and setting, we did confirm it was a level one trauma center. This was the best place to treat Joe at the time. Um, keeping in mind that, that you know, the next step would probably be an acute care setting, acute 
care rehab setting. Reporting the assessment information um, and ex expected recovery to the insurance company or the insurance carrier is um, very, very important. And any longevity that you can give them in terms of care needs and expected expenses, this helps them set reserves. And again, reserves are not a case management function. However, your assessment information that can inform those decisions for the carrier are very, very important. And long-term uh, cost expectancy is, is very important when you're dealing with an, a catastrophic injury. Um, the insurance carrier needs to be informed of the longevity, an estimated longevity. We can, we can never say for sure, everybody's different, um, but also expected care needs in the future. So a well thought out compassionate approach to deal with catastrophic injury and subsequent health issues are increasingly important. Next slide, please. So in the ICU, and I don't want you to concentrate on this clinical data, but I do think it's important to just kind of set the stage. So Joe was found on CAT scan to have a left subdural um, hematoma with a five millimeter midline shift, which means that the hematoma is pushing on Joe's brain and it was determined that he will require some surgery. So as he was prepped for surgery um, and, and urgently taken, um, things went well and um, he was still in the neuro ICU. Uh, don't, please don't focus on the details of the surgery. It's not the important piece here. What is important to know is whether you're a nurse or a social worker or another allied health professional that's, that's performing the case management role, um, you really need to be informed by the, by the medical professionals caring for the patient what the expected outcomes are, what treatment is needed, if further surgeries are expected, um, what is not known, what are the risks involved with this type of injury, what can we expect when Joe is wakes up. So collaborating with providers to ensure they're explaining this as well to his wife and um, support system is also a case management function. So understanding the expectations yourself in, in some form. Uh, again, even if you're not a nurse, you should have some idea, the expectation if you are dealing with catastrophic injury. And also uh, coordinating those communications with the family and listening in to what they're telling the family. So if questions come up later, you can support what's already been told. But if new questions come up, working within your scope of practice, making sure you set up another meeting to, um, to address those issues. So as I mentioned, it's um, clear to the multi-professional team that um, Joe was gonna need acute rehab following his uh, hospitalization. And the family and support system also needed to understand that he wasn't gonna be coming home from the hospital. He would probably be going to an acute rehab setting where he would um, undergo intense therapy to address his physical, uh, physical um, issues as well as his cognitive. So working together with the hospital case manager, they developed the best plan. And the, you know, working together to know that um, we really needed to be planning um, for the long term and not just the next setting. So sharing with the acute care case manager what the plans are, you know, the, the housing situation, those kind of things, just helps with a better plan altogether. Joe and his family continued to be seen regularly in the ICU by the case manager. Again, developing that trusting rapport, um, just being there and being a constant and a consistent, um, uh, consistently communication communicating with the family um, sets the stage for that trust to, to develop. Also, just also maintaining those boundaries and making sure they still understand there is a dual relationship and that your responsibility is to keep the carrier involved, um, but you would be there to assist in any way possible as long as the insurance carry allows it. And, and if you set the stage that way, you're not over-promising or um, not able to deliver later. And in the spirit of fidelity, the case manager just continues to support and keep in close contact um, in, 
and uh, develop that trust. Next slide, please. Okay, so Joe is deemed um, strong enough for transfer to the neuro step down unit. Um, he, the tube was removed, removed from his airway and he was hemodynamically stable. Um, he did have residual right-sided weakness. So he had right-sided hemiparesis um, from the head injury and he is right-handed. So uh, he also had some difficulty speaking, some cognitive de deficits and memory issues um, along with some higher level executive functioning. And in the acute care setting, that's really, you know, it's, it's a little early to determine where Joe's gonna end up, but those were really important assessment um, uh, observations to share with the carrier and with, um, and make sure the, under, the family understood. He was seen by um, a rehab physiatrist, which is a physical medicine and rehab doctor, as well as uh, physical, occupational, and speech therapy evaluations were conducted um, with plans for an acute inpatient re rehab stay. Next slide, please. So Joe was progressing in the acute hospital with some therapies, and it was thought that um, he was going to be able to tolerate three hours of therapy a day. So it was determined with the interdisciplinary team that um, the recommendation would be for Joe to be transferred to an acute care facility specializing in traumatic brain injury, um, where he could continue to progress and, um, and be in a, a safe, um, appropriate clinical setting. So he's, Joe is still not able to really participate in discharge planning due to his cognitive deficits. So um, the worker comp case manager was working with the wife um, who verbalized that she was just feeling overwhelmed and asked if her children could be involved in those meetings. So in response, the case manager um, in made sure that the adult children were involved in discharge planning and began to um, explain the best place for acute rehab was about 40 miles from their house. Um, it was understood by the family that there was a subacute setting in a skilled nursing facility right around the corner where they thought their dad was going to go. However, the case manager was um, the ethical principle of beneficence to do good needed to um, objectively present the facts of why the acute rehab was a was better fit for Joe's needs. Um, remember to do good. So the case manager um, sometimes, you know, in in a catastrophic injury, especially, um, they're flown to a trauma center and then they're from a remote area. And the case manager is really challenged by finding providers that are appropriate in their area. And there are sometimes challenges in explaining to families or carriers why appropriate care may be a little bit further away or may cost a little more than, than expected. Um, however, again, you do it right the first time, you don't have to do it again. And in, in for the good of Joe, um, being objective and um, stating the reasons why what one facility can do, what Joe's needs are, and then compare that to another facility without being negative and without calling anything out. Case managers can also ask for assistance from the acute rehab setting and ask a coordinator to come out. A lot of times they have assessment planners that will come out and meet with family and go over what their facility can provide um, as well as um, provide a tour to the family. So they feel more comfortable with, with where their loved one would go. So we know that the case manager is obligated under the construct of veracity to present all the options factually. And again, uh, state and regulatory guidelines may change um, how, uh, what's, what's available. So I, I understand in Rhode Island, um, there it is uh, injured workers choice and medical expenses are to be paid. It's not that way in every state. So you just need to know your jurisdictional and state guidelines. You need to know which states um, require that um, three options are provided to an injured worker to choose from. 
um, some states allow for carrier and employer influence on those choices. So you just need to know where you're working and the jurists of the case you're working on in order to stay within the realm of, of your regulations. So as the, uh, as the conversations continued, the um, eldest son was a, little dis was a little uncomfortable with the acute care setting. However, um, all in all, after all of the coordinated meetings and um, presenting the information at several different times on the phone, in person, the case manager was able to get the family to agree um, ultimately to the acute care setting. Autonomy and self-determination are many times used interchangeably, but there are some nuances um, to these terms. Autonomy is respecting another person's right to self-determine a course of action to support their independent decision-making. Self-determination, on the other hand, is the ability to decide by a course of action based on information that's provided plus values, beliefs, and life goals without undue influence. Thus, the injured worker or their representative has enough ability to determine their own behavior in accordance with the plan chosen um, and developed by themselves. So uh, it's really the uh, case manager's role to facilitate that and ensure that they have the ability to do that. Of course, again, I can't stress this enough, um, and, and, I, and I'm not um, claiming to be expert, but if there is attorney involvement, you need to follow the state and jurisdictional guidelines for, um, for their involvement and make sure you're following those regulations. But just always be aware of where you're working and what those guidelines are that govern your license and your certification. Next slide, please. So again, um, we agreed to um, the facility uh, transfer, um, the case management, uh, the case manager assured um, ongoing assessment and evaluation would take place when they, when he changed from the acute care hospital to the, um, the new facility, on-site visits would be done by the case manager to keep his wife informed of what was happening. Um, and the um, acute care facility also um, offered transportation for family training and for some visits that also allayed the fears of the family so that, so that his wife could be um, involved in that. So case managers are not obligated to meet their clients' needs endlessly, but they are obligated to meet what ca uh, case management ethical standards expect. So this includes adherence to the law, um, and your regulatory um, and certification, your, your practice guidelines. Um, and in doing so, you need to be very careful. It's very easy to get caught up in a catastrophic injury uh, management and to provide a lot of information. It's okay if you're providing information that was, was heard in tandem with the family by another healthcare provider but you have to be very careful of medical opinion versus diagnosis. So case managers need to know their capabilities and perform duties abiding by restrictions or allowances stated by their licensure, including providing medical information, providing medical opinion that may border on diagnosis. So you have the duty to reveal that um, you would need to confirm particular diagnosis or pieces of information with a medical doctor, and you can only share objective symptom reporting or um, observations. Next slide, please. Okay, so the worker comp case manager continues to work with the rehab facility and kind of starts over with their assessment, assessment of this new facility, assessment of, of where we're going, what is the plan here? How long will Joe be there? Um, what are the goals? Um, after assessing Joe, what do they think will be the outcome? Um, although those questions sometimes, you know, in, on the onset are, are a little early to answer and Joe will continue to progress. We do have a, a, an idea as professionals who work with head injury, um, what to expect and have an idea of what we should be planning for 
um, at discharge. So again, discharge starts at admission. So although he'll be likely to be in the rehab uh, center for a little while, um, we need to assess his home and assess the community and look at what he's going to need to enter back into his home safely and back into community. So in, in addressing all these information, all this information up front, it just helps inform our discharge planning and be, to be ready for what's going to happen when he is ready to go home. Next slide, please. So during Joe's rehab stay, a home assessment was conducted. Um, and one, one thing I did neglect to, to mention that is in the acute care setting, um, uh, case managers can conduct a home visit, go out, look at the home, take some pictures so that they're ready and they have those photos available for therapists who will be working with Joe in the acute care setting. Um, a formal home evaluation for safety though can be coordinated and which was coordinated with the therapists that were working with him in the um, rehab center. So keeping in mind, um, collecting data about what, what was Joe's daily life like? He, he, would, he would bathe, um, he would clean his home, he would do light housekeeping, did errands, he moved around the, the, the home freely, um, did yard work, walked the dog. Uh, some of those activities are no longer going to be possible, at least when he initially returns home. So um, making sure that um, that is the expectation, not only of the family, um, but also as Joe starts to become more cognitively aware, having him understand what, um, uh, what the expectations are. So during the home assessment, the therapists were able to point out some scatter rugs that needed to be moved, um, looked at the half bath downstairs, and it was decided that it was not really functional for bathing for Joe. Um, so uh, looking at other options for that. The full bath upstairs had enough um, area to um, accommodate for Joe and his equipment um, that would po probably be in need um, however, there was 13 steps to get to the second floor. So options around that were also discussed. Um, it was also discussed with his wife, what, what things could be, some furniture could be moved um, to open up the pathway from the front door to the living area, to the steps that would need to go upstairs. The uh, facility case manager and the worker comp case manager then came back and met with the multi uh, professional team at the rehab and talked about the outcomes of that, the physicians, the nurses, um, case managers, and others in Joe, uh, others involved with Joe. During that meeting, it was determined that based on his progress, that he was probably going to need a hemi walker. He had the left side was his strong side. Um, he would probably need that for household, for safe household ambulation with um, uh, distant supervision, so there needed to be somebody there initially. He would need a lightweight folding wheelchair for community reintegration, so when he went out of the house to doctor's visits or to the store or something like that, he would need a lightweight wheelchair that could be folded up and put in the car. He would need to be able to do safe car transfers to go home. Um, he may, necessitate, he may uh, be in need of, and it was at least initially, of a mod um, temporary modified ramp in the front of the house to get him up the six steps in the wheelchair safely um, until he was able to progress to the point where he may be able to negotiate that um, with the Hemi Walker. It was decided there needed to be some grab bars installed in, in both the powder room downstairs and the bathroom upstairs, the powder room being used for daytime use and the, bath, the, the bathroom upstairs for, um, for bathing and dressing. A tub transfer bench was also requested um, for safe transfers into the tub and shower, as well as a handheld um, shower head to use um, to help him and to help a caregiver that was helping him with bathing. It was recommended by the therapist that consideration be given to the possibility of a chairlift being installed um, uh, on the stairwell so that he could access his bedroom and the safe bathroom upstairs. 
which far outweighed the cost of modifying the powder room downstairs to make it a full bath. So the case manager had to be creative in um, that communication and discussion with the carrier um, in order to um, show the value of um, allowing Joe access to the upstairs of his house. This house was owned, there was no mortgage, they had no plans in moving. Um, so it made sense at that point to um, have a chairlift installed for Joe's safe um, uh, up and uh, up and down mobility up and down the stairs. Again, you need to know your state and jurisdictional guidelines around home modification. Um, sometimes there are caps um, for certain states that are put on on home modifications, and also know. Um, know from a carrier's point of view before you mention anything to the family, um, how they view modifications to the home and what their stance is on that before you have that awkward conversation that the therapist um, recommended a stair lift and the carrier is not in support of that. So you really wanna make sure you have those conversations before presenting that to the family. In addition, he was gonna have some home therapy initially when he was discharged home and also um, initially a couple hours of a personal care attendant to help his wife have a little bit of time to run to the grocery store and, and know that he would be safe at home. So the ethical construct of justice comes into play here. It's really important that Joe be accorded the same level of service as any other injured worker who has a similar injury or head injury survivor, regardless of the cause of injury or of the source of payment. So it's a, fund, it's a fundamental role of a case manager to negotiate um, the necessity of the chairlift, as I mentioned, um, with the idea that Joe would be in this home for the long haul and that it was definitely less expensive than um, a bathroom renovation on the first floor in order to make that um, accessible to him. So if services or care were denied to Joe, um, yet provided to another employee with a similar diagnosis, this would be indicative of um, inequity. Luckily that, that did not occur. Next slide, please. Okay, neuropsychology. Um, typically in the course of rehab, a neuropsychiatry neuropsych consult is um, requested. And that helps us assess the level of cognitive um, dysfunction or higher level executive dysfunction that Joe was experiencing. So cognitive, behavioral, and emotional problems can uh, occur after brain injury and may impact significantly, significantly on um, work and family relationships. Um, some people have problems um, even months or years after a head injury, and they can come in phases. So we may see um, uh, problematic behaviors develop as they begin to recover. Um, for severe injuries, um, there's slow but steady, steady improvements expected. Um, but we really say that it takes about 18 to 24 months to figure out after a head injury, after a severe head injury, kind of where they're going to plateau. Sometimes that happens a little bit sooner, and sometimes they continue to make um, gains after that, that period of time, just not as measurable as, as in the beginning. If problematic behaviors develop after brain injury, such as verbal or physical aggression, you can see inappropriate sexual behavior. Um, behavior modification can be used to encourage more appropriate response. So cognitive rehab um, can also be used to help improve um, attention, memory, and language deficits um, in conjunction with what speech therapy is doing as well. And finally, various psychosocial approaches may be used, which will can help um, patients to learn to cope emotionally with their disabilities and to reestablish meaning in their life. So on return home, um, Joe's wife will need to be careful about his safety and it, you know, making sure to account for um, poor judgment, forgetfulness, some impulsivity and other behaviors. So the neuro neuropsychologist will look at those at some behavior modifications to assist, but also um, to um, make sure that it's understood by the family that this is an ongoing process and things are going to change. And, and also for Joe, he's frustrated too uh, about um, his cognitive dysfunction, his memory loss, 
um, it's always more difficult when they're aware of their, their deficits after a brain injury. Um, in addition to the home visit, the occupational therapist was also able to instruct Joe's wife for when he returned home on such things as removing knobs from the front of the stove, um, locking the doors to the basement and some other safety techniques. So when they're home alone, um, she does not have to worry um, all the time, but just know that she's, she's taken some safety precautions. Next slide, please. Okay, so projection for return to work. <clears throat> what do we know? We know that Joe needs a Hemi walker for right-sided weakness. He has some cognitive dysfunction. He has some memory loss. He has some higher level executive functioning disorders that um, cause him difficulty with multitasking, organization, motivation. Um, work would be very difficult for him with the inability to prioritize and complete tasks. So. Um, it was decided that he would not be able to return, obviously, to the construction site, but also, um, ultimately, he wasn't able to return to a uh, light duty or desk position either because of the higher level functioning disorders. So in this case, um, it was important to plan out to provide Joe with other activities. So what is he going to fill his time doing? He was working 60 to 70 hours a week. And now he's home um, with some dysfunction and uh, needs to, um, to fill his time. So um, making sure that he has access to leisure activities, he has a way to get back to church. He had making sure he has a way to um, get to, to um, attend social interactions and other meaningful activities, such as the volunteering he was doing with his wife is really, really key. And the case manager really needs to be sure that those um, those issues are addressed. Next slide, please. Okay. Ultimately, after about 20 months, again, um, you know, it's different with every um, employer. It's different with, with different carriers, how long a case manager will be involved. Again, our cases, we work with them for about 18 to 24 months um, following a severe injury like this. At about 20 months, it was determined that Joe had met his maximum um, medical improvement, meaning he wasn't making um, noticeable gains, although he would continue to make small gains throughout um, just working at home and moving around, using his walker, those kinds of things. He was able to independently transfer from surface to surface. He was able to walk with the Hemi walker independently for short distance and household distances. So really not in the community. He was using the wheelchair in the community for safety on uneven surfaces and places that he was not familiar with. Um, and once he was home, he was still having challenges with the executive function and couldn't really sustain his employment, as I mentioned, or be left alone for extended periods of time. Eventually, he was able to be left home for about an hour or two um, independently, uh, but that came after um, after about a, uh, a year and a half that he was able to do that. Uh, he applied with the hope of help of a social worker from the facility for a disability. Um, and, and I mentioned that he did have a personal care attendant for a couple of hours in the beginning of his transfer back to home. Um, this also, you know, having the, the personal care attendant also allowed his wife a little break. Um, kept her engaged and also some time to go out and do some errands without um, having to um, take Joe with her. Case managers in the worker comp setting work daily to address the needs of injured workers advocating um, for their needs and fulfilling responsibilities to the employer, the payer, sometimes an attorney um, with who they work. So um, as we close, I just want to say that Understanding the underlying values and principles of case managers is important in care coordination. Um, and the underlying values of case management are based on the belief that case management is a means of improving health and wellness and autonomy through advocacy, communication, education, identification of service resources, and service facilitation. 
This while keeping the employer and payer in, informed of the progress throughout, which is really the main difference in, in workers' comp is this, this um, uh, other entity that it needs to be informed. It's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into more depth. However, um, established acceptable ethical standards and pra of practice, such as those discussed today, can help inform and guide the practice of case management in the arena of workers' compensation. Throughout his long, difficult recovery, Joe's family remained actively involved, and um, it was the approach of the workers' comp case manager that provided the support that they needed and facilitated this, this uh, positive outcome. So with that, I would like to move to um, questions and answers. Michelle, we did have um, one that asked if there were copies of the PowerPoint available for attendees. Um, that's a good question. Ellen, are, are we able to, uh, I'm gonna defer to Ellen at CCMC. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, generally, no, we do not usually provide the slides. Okay. Um, well, I, I found that the, um, the presentation was uh, very enjoyable and, and very interesting. I really appreciate the authenticity of having that case study approach to learning. Um, and I'm just looking to see if there are any more. Um, do you ever have to do cost benefit analysis for the workers comp insurance to document how and why you are requesting certain treatment recommendations to obtain authorization? So, and that would depend on the, the carrier you're working with and your employer. So sometimes it's within your realm to do that um, if, if that is what your employer offers as, as part of. If you're an independent case manager, again, that would be up to yourself and, and the carrier. Um, we do that in a team approach where, uh, at Paradigm. So that's my experience with, with that piece. Um, that's how I can answer that question. And another question was, was a driver's eval done to assess his ability to drive? So it was not done. And, and because his cognitive abilities never really quite got to the point that he would be deemed a safe driver, the therapist did not recommend uh, a driver eval um, for, for uh, Joe. Okay. Well, I, I see that some people have to jump off because I see the numbers there. So I just wanted to remind participants that I did put Richard's um, email address there to fill out the evaluations. It's very important for your CEUs to do so. Um, and it gets returned to richard at biari.org. Um, any more questions to, before we wrap up? Do you have recommendations for TBI support groups? Well, I, oh, I have always used, uh, I'm in the Maryland area and I've always used the Brain Injury Association for those types of resources. So. Um, you're, you're looking at the experts right now. <laughs> that would be our recommendation too. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I think that's the end of the questions. There are a lot of comments and thank you for your, your positive feedback. Um, I thank people for being really patient with us in the beginning. We have a very small office and we went to as far away as possible to try to not get that reverberation <laughs> in the beginning. So um, since this was our first one that we did, we hope that we'll learn from it. And I hope that it didn't hurt your hearing too much. Um, <laughs> really appreciate you bearing with us because you never know until it happens, right? <laughs> um, any more questions? I don't, thank you very much. I, we, well, we certainly appreciate your time and your information. And this concludes the first session of our conference series for the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island. Get in touch with us at any time. Uh, please check our conference series on BIA.org. We have five more in the series that run from May through um, October. And you can always call us here in the office as well. If you have any questions, 401-228-3319. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.